and we are live and welcome to the panel i'm so excited i have some really great authors in the studio today uh well the virtual studio i guess you could say and i'm a fan a long time fan of a couple of them so if i seem a little fangirlish you'll have to forgive me i'm diane morrison I'm your hostess, and I'm the current manager of the SIFWA YouTube channel, and I'll let my other authors introduce themselves, starting with Ike. Hey, Elle. I'm Ike Flintart. I'm all the way down in Brisbane in Australia, uh, urban fantasy and young adult fantasy author, and very pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for being here. Um, Ike and Stephanie and I are going to be in, we're working on a project together. So this is how we happen to connect. And this is the first time we've met face to face. So I'm very pleased that you could be here and that's awesome. And then next we have a personal friend of mine. Uh, we actually met through her writing. She is an urban fantasy author. Her name is Sarah. Hi, my name is Sarah Berman. I write urban fantasy and dabble in pretty much all things fantasy, regardless of urban or not. So, here we go. Well, welcome. So glad you could be here tonight. There you are. For some reason, it didn't flip over to you right away, but we heard you, so it's cool. And then we have Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Barr. I uh, write fantasy and science fiction um, and uh, combinations thereof. So I've got the full spectrum from one end to the other uh, on that particular aspect. And uh, interestingly enough, um, there was a book that had uh, Mercedes Lackey in it that got me started on fantasy in the first place. So there you go. I think that many of us will probably have a story like that the rest of us here so i'm so yeah that's cool actually uh i forgot to mention that of course that as a uh am involved with sifwa naturally i'm also a writer but you've heard that if you've watched the program before i write things where fantasy and science fiction blend or one or the other as well so i'm sure that stephanie and i will have lots to talk about about that so that's very cool and then our headliners tonight. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mercedes Lackey. And I'm Larry Dixon. And the only thing we haven't written is porn. That you know of. <laughs> well, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, an, it's an honorable profession. To be fair, it was science fiction erotica. Outstanding. All right. <laughs> Well, I'm so that, glad you guys are here. We went zero to porn very quickly, didn't we? We did. I don't know how that happened, but I think that's really fun. <laughs> well, cool. All right. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm sorry for those of you who are used to this being at a different hour, but this was when Larry, and if I may, like all your fans, call you Misty. Of this course. Awesome, awesome. So this is when they were available. So and the rest of us are kind of either, well, Ike's in. I mean, I think she said it was four o'clock in the afternoon for her. So that's cool. And the rest of us are kind of night owls a bit. So that's all right. Our topic tonight, what is fantasy? So where are the limits? Where does it become something else? Um, what do we define it as? And I figured that I'd let everybody kind of just, you know, give their own little brief statement about what they thought, and we'd go from there. So who would like to start? You would. I would. I would. Do you think? Yeah, okay, you're the well, moderator. Hey, why not? I I guess so. Sure, right? If if I'm going to ask you guys to do it, I got to do it. Okay. So for me, fantasy literature is something that you are not entirely certain could actually happen in the physical universe that we know of, right? So it has something where the laws of physics don't behave the way they're supposed to. 
or that we understand them or where we have physical proof of mythological creatures or the casting of magic. Um, religious beliefs aside, I'll point out that I am a pagan witch, so obviously I do believe in a form of magic in the physical reality that we have, but the understanding of how that works is different in literature, right? So for me, that's basically it. Now, that's a pretty broad range as far as I'm concerned. I don't know if other people share my opinion, and I would love to hear what they have to say. Well, you know, there's you've got Clark's Law, which is anything that's uh, any technology that's sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And then you've got Lackey's Law, which is any magic is, that is sufficiently complicated is indistinguishable from tech. I totally believe that. That makes perfect sense to me. But it, from my viewpoint, being a scientist in, in the regular day, um, I make a distinction between things that fit in within our understanding of the real world from a, from a scientist standpoint and things that aren't. And so things that violate the laws of physics as we know it, like say shapeshifters, which change mass. There's no physical way for that to fit in with our current understanding of science. And bear in mind, I understand the distinction between knowing everything and knowing our little piece of it now. So that's where I make my distinction, my, my when I talk about uh, psychic power, when I talk about um, uh, people with psionics and telekinesis or anything like that, I will put that into the fantasy category, even though I'm not discounting the possibility it could exist, but it doesn't fit within our current understanding of science. That's how I define it. I always had a, a very simplistic definition as a kid when I was growing up reading fantasy. To me, it always seemed like it had to have magic. That was it. That made it fantasy. And then, unfortunately, when I grew up and I started writing, and I was right, the one of the latest books I've written is I thought it was science fantasy because it was half and half. And so now I'm really not sure anymore what distinguishes fantasy. I was recently on a panel with uh, David Farland when we were asked the same question. And he actually said, uh, fantasy is everything. All fiction is fantasy. And I think we were all a bit too intimidated to disagree with him. But I, I'm still leaning towards the magic constitutes fantasy. But it's a bit blurry. Sarah's tried a couple times to jump in there, but her mic is quieter. So we got to got to keep an eye on that but go ahead sarah you're obviously the only one left so you get to talk now <laughs> i get to speak yay um i i have to agree with both you and actually all of you combined um, to me fantasy is that thing that is imagination of what could be science in the future but is not science now it could be magic it could be you know, any number of things, but we know that it is not likely to be accepted as reality by the mainstream. Okay, fair enough. Um, anybody want to respond to anything that anybody else has said so far? Anybody got thoughts on that? I actually think one of the reasons that uh, fantasy is so popular is because it might not be reality, but we want it to be so, so badly. I, I like one of the things that I really like about fantasy and, and part of it as a writer, but, but as a reader, I liked it too, is I could reflect real life issues in an environment that I could concoct entirely on my own, make my own rules, make some things that worked the way I wish the real world worked and then but have issues and social commentary that still had to do with um the real world and and, and make it impression in other words tell a story about something using a, an analog in my fantasy world 
Are we having technical issues? I see headphones being removed. Uh-oh. Oh dear, okay. <laughs> okay, fair enough. You'll have to resort to sign language, Misty. <laughs> That's the hokey pokey. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a group chat function, by the way, if you need to get a message to us through the keyboard, just so you know, and it's on the side of the screen there. I don't know if you've got it fired up, but I've got it here, so if you type something to me, I will get it. In the meantime, we'll carry on. Um, okay, so for me, one of the interesting things is where the, the border is and when it shifts. Are you guys back up? Yes, you're back up and running. Okay, go ahead. Are we good? You're good. Uh, Dynamite, yeah, we just had a, a minor technical problem with the phantom power to the mic. It's good now. Um, well, all right, I'll go back to the earlier question. Uh, about what makes fantasy uh, versus science fiction seem to be where we were headed. Uh, for me, science fiction is uh, a form of storytelling in which uh, technology, our reaction to it, or even absence of it, is an integral part of the story. Uh, for me, uh, fantasy can also have science fiction elements in it as well, but the point really isn't about the technology. It's more about uh, the characters and how they react to hardships and situations they find themselves in um, on a level that we would tend to have analogs to in real life. Some people argue that fantasy is more relatable than science fiction, uh, and it tends to be more about relationships. So you don't think the stories that involve people's reactions to fantasy are similar to the stories that react uh, people's reactions to science fiction? Well, I'd, I'd say that, yeah, they're often quite similar. Uh, and the lines can certainly blur, the obvious example being Star Wars. I mean, that's mm. space fantasy. And uh, <sighs> Why is there no genre on the bookshelves called science fantasy? There used to be. Yeah. Oh. There used to be. Back in the 50s, there was science fantasy. Actually, back in the 50s and the 60s, uh, it was all on one shelf. <laughs> science fiction and fantasy were together because so many of the, of the writers wrote both, like Fritz Leiber wrote both fantasy and science fiction. And on top of that, he wrote a horror to confuse the matter a bit. <laughs> so it was all on one shelf. Yeah, I guess what to call it has been a long argument. I understand there used to be screaming fights over the whole, no, don't call it sci-fi, that's not serious, you know, and yeah. stuff like that, right? Oh. Lately, people are using speculative fiction, but people are also using that as a term for stuff that isn't either. They don't want it to be called science fiction or fantasy, but it's got science fiction or fantasy elements in it. I, I have a real chip on my shoulder about that particular attitude. <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've gone on it before, but... Um, okay, just what I, Just oh, don't no, go ahead. call me late for my royalty check. That's all I yep. ask. Call it what See, you want. There you go. That's yeah. the attitude, I think. I think that's the right attitude. Yeah. Um, for, I mean, there's an argument, though, right? Like, the, that's, that's one of the arguments. doesn't matter. Right. Is it uh, I mean, mostly it's a marketing tool, really. Right. It's something the publishers like to have so that they can put you in a nice little box and put a brand name on you and people will know what you are. Right. It's not mainly mainstream. It's not mainly romance because the romance will be an element, but it's not the focus of the of the story. It's not mainly Western because although it may be a Western setting, the focus is not on the Western aspect. You know, it's it's basically a whole bunch of well, it's not. <laughs> Rather than we're it what's is. left over after the questions are asked. Yeah, we're what's left after the questions are asked. That's cool, actually. I like that. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I I do a lot of stuff where the there's a border, right? Like I write weird westerns. And I write um, stuff that's space opera, but it's, I mean, everything's accomplished with magic. There is no science involved, right? So 
I, I like that. I like the, it's not. Okay, well, it's not science fiction because it's not. There's no science, right? It's not a Western because, yeah, it's more about, uh, you know, guys in uh, Western clothes acting like paladins, you know, right? That's So, yeah, I, I, I like that a lot. I don't know. What do you guys think? What do, what do you think, Stephanie, actually? Because you're kind of on that where is the science fiction fantasy border, right? But the, the border between the two for me is whether or not we're focused on science. But I have two books that I would call um, science fantasy because they have uh, uh, what I consider a realistic life. You know, I've got a spacecraft crashed on a planet, but my main characters are have psychic power and are shaped. So that element I consider fantasy, but everything I throw at them I consider scientifically plausible. It's, it depends upon the writer, of course. Uh, the way that Misty and I mostly work, especially on the Valdemar material, is the magic system is a supplement to real-world physics, if that makes sense. We have everything possible in the world working according to all that we know about uh, post-talking physics. And then there is the added layer. The added layer is there's a power source that we don't we are not currently able to tap into, which is basically how we plan all of our magic systems, with the exception of the Five Hundred Kingdoms books. Yeah, which is quite silly stuff, and it's very fun. Uh, so what you find in the Valdemar books is that if there is something, for instance, that a steam boiler can do or a spell can do they'll build the steam boiler because it's more reliable. Uh, if there's something that can be done by uh, the means of, of normal engineering and physics, they'll go that way because anytime you're dealing with the magic in the world... Uh, it's got to go through a person and that exhausts the person. And additionally, one of the dangers is it, it builds up heat. You know, you, you need to be able to dump the heat off in some way. Uh, very bad appren apprentices become ash. Yikes. <laughs> but, you know, it's that way whenever you're working with, with automobiles or rockets or whatever, you know, you're, you're dealing with heat exchange as a constant. And we try to remind people the real physics, they still apply even if you're using magic. Uh, what else can we answer for you? You know, I, I like that about the Valdemar books. I really enjoy that aspect. The fact that, you know, you guys have thought about the sort of the, the real world consequences of such things. I mean, do we really want to live in a world where people can throw fireballs at us? Like, would that be a world we want to live in? Would those people not be the most scary damn people ever? <laughs> like, well, and it's also the possibility that if you're throwing fireballs, that means the heat is coming from somewhere. And if it's not coming from you and you're not getting frostbite, some someplace, somewhere, there's a nice <laughs> little ice stalactite forming. It could, yeah, it could be, uh, uh, you know, atomic activity being sucked up from uh, uh, the local area. Anyway, sorry. Um, <sighs> Do you find that's a problem with uh, a lot of new fantasy authors that they don't, thoroughly enough think through the science and the consequences of the magic and it's too it's too easy there's no effect that's negative to balance out the positive uh, i i <sighs> have i pick up a lot of the free books from from amazon to look at on the kindle and yes <laughs> in mm -hmm. a word yes uh, if it if it has if it has zero dollars on it, I have found one gem out of fifty, mm -hmm. and the rest yeah. of them are delete, yeah. precisely for a lot of those reasons. Well, yeah. there's there's a uh, what a, there's ooh, a detrimental philosophy that it works because it's magic, and that's simply laziness. Uh, but devil's advocate, a lot of young writers uh, don't take a lot of world issues into account because they simply haven't learned about them yet. Yeah. You know, in our case, Misty comes from a scientific background. I came from a precocious background. So we've been voracious learners and we're very interested in how 
how generations work, how people work, how governments work, how infrastructure works, uh, how you know, stuff works, how, how stuff works. And so people often enjoy our books because we touch on a little bit of everything from sociology to forms of government to personal hygiene to survival skills to um, one of the latest things that's developed in the Valdemar books is the Trahir, which is a, a rail running alongside some of the major roads and you simply drop a tiller onto it and it allows unskilled labor to guide horses for periods along the trip. And that's a far, far early predecessor to what eventually is a railroad. But that's a long ways down the line. Uh, but that's how real history goes. Yeah, I know my background is as a geologist and uh, the story I'm publishing this year is uh, based on a world that has no iron. And it even for me, it took a lot of research and a lot of thinking to work out how that would affect every aspect of the world, including the fantasy elements, as well as the technology and science. And it just astonishes me when you pick up a book that is just so superficial that you think, no, just 10 minutes of thought and you would have worked out that that's just not possible, magic or not. <laughs> and I've got to touch on this, which is uh, I, I come from a gaming background as well, late 70s, and I've worked on about 60 role-playing games over the years. And there are simply hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, who knows how many books where, hey, let's turn our game into a novel. And you can hear the dice rolling as you read it. And it's just excruciating to go through. Oh. But to be fair, there's lots of novels where you know for a fact it came from role-playing games and you can't hear the dice rolling. Like the Deed of Paxenarian, which was awesome. And that is clearly a paladin's adventures, you know? Anybody who's done any gaming knows that, right? That's a fact. Yeah, but you can't. You can't hear the dice rolling. She's she. I mean, Elizabeth Moon, she did a great job, right? She's, so. Oh, she's great. Yeah, you betcha. Yeah. Has Sarah been trying to say anything? I'm just double checking because you've been so quiet and that's not like you. Well, actually, you know, I'm I'm perfectly willing to take a back seat when there's some really great conversation going. So uh, I, I've been enjoying what everybody else has said so far and um, I, I haven't heard anything that I completely disagree with. So <laughs> there we Fair go. Clearly. We need to say something way more controversial then. Come on, somebody say something <laughs> controversial. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the borders. Let's talk about some of these things where things cross over, right? Um, okay, so the obvious comparison is science fiction and fantasy. It's the border, just it has something scientific in it. And if that's so, does that mean that it changes as our understanding of science changes as to what qualifies. I'll bring up a couple cases in point. Anne McCaffrey was very adamant that she was a science fiction writer. If you read the Pern books, they have all the little tropes of, of fantasy that I so love. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and, but it's clearly science fiction. Everything has a perfectly reasonable, from the science of the time, scientific explanation. Dragons might not actually be possible due to mass issues, but we don't really know that, right? So fair enough, right? I don't, I don't require a lot of science for my science fiction. You know, give me a, a veneer that makes sense and I'm willing to buy it, right? So, but she also wrote the Pegasus novels and the Pegasus novels were all about psychics, right? Now at the time, parapsychology was a perfectly accepted uh, method of study. The reason why it's not currently an acceptable field of study is because we have not seen any direct evidence that psychic phenomenon exists. We know that some people are more likely to guess things correctly when you're testing for things than the law of averages gives, but we know it's not we, it's not, not usually consistent and it's difficult to reproduce an experiment. So, right? So is that still science fiction? Or is that now fantasy? And, you know, what does that mean? Well, there was a 
a huge uh, shakeup in the sci-fi community when um, they de essentially they decided that because of, I believe it was Hawking, um, proved that faster than light travel was not possible. Or Einstein proved it and then Hawking disproved it or something. But it, essentially what, what they were talking about was whether or not warp speed was actually possible. And what it did was it kind of threw Star Trek and all of that stuff into kind of this limbo state where people were writing this sci-fi, but it was being seen as fantasy because that science was not considered possible. And then more research and, and studies and, and theories have come out that have given this glimmer of hope that, you know, warp speed is possible. So now it's back in the, the, the sci-fi area. So, you know, I, I think it depends more on who's making those judgment calls, you know, whether or not the science is considered valid enough to constitute sci-fi as opposed to fantasy. And, you know, obviously, I personally think that, you know, the number one people that you need to reach is the readers. So it's kind of dependent on what the readers think for me as to whether or not it's a sci-fi or fantasy. If the readers are pretty much unanimous that, you know, something like Star Trek is going to be sci-fi, then, you know, what you're writing is sci-fi because that's what your audience is. But obviously there, there are people who consider themselves more gatekeepers who disagree with that particular idea and have a more um, delineated barrier to what is sci-fi versus fantasy. I actually have a bigger problem with Star Trek and their complete lack of orbital mechanics and Newtonian physics. Um, I don't have a problem with faster than light travel because I think it's, and I, this actually goes with, with, uh, Psy uh, psionics as well when we start talking about whether or not psychic power to me there's a big difference as a scientist I have a tendency to think that anything that hasn't been disproven is still on the table so I put it as a fantasy element when I talk about my own but at the same time I don't I don't tell myself that it's impossible because we haven't proven it's impossible we haven't proven it exists which is not the same thing as proving it doesn't exist. And now when we start talking about people changing masses, like my shapeshifters, that's a little bit harder to explain. But, but some of the other stuff I'm, uh, I'm a little bit more open on. And I know that our perception of science, if you look at 100 years ago versus today, to say in 2,000 years it couldn't look entirely different is uh, very delusional as in how much science you think you know now. Because what we don't know is way bigger than what we know. That's my view anyway. By the way, you do, do you know that Fritz Leiber solved that problem of shapeshifters changing mass? I did not. I'm curious to hear what it was. It's in one of the Fafford and Mauser stories where they have, oh, yeah. where, where they go shape shifting. And basically, uh, if you get bulking up, you absorb the, the extra mass from the organic matter around you, which caused somebody who was fat, who was standing next to somebody who was shape shifting to suddenly become thin. And they, they didn't want it back again. <laughs> And the I, uh, and uh, the con the con the converse was was when Mauser turned into a mat literal mouse. Uh, he left a pool of pink slime all around him when he dumped his mass. Honestly, which of us hasn't done that at some point? <laughs> I try to keep my pink slime to a minimum, yeah. just because I don't want to have to explain it. Uh, to me, I get a little reductive about all of this uh, because people will read what you're doing because they are making a deal with you. They want to be affected by you. And they pick up a book because they're open to new concepts. They want to see what you have to say. Well, whenever you're looking at science fiction, all right, so you have a starship. What's the point of the starship? They're going to go somewhere. 
Well, all right. So you got a stargate. What's the point of the stargate? They're going to go somewhere. You have a magical teleportation. What's the point? They're going to go somewhere. So in a way, all that you address in any of our forms of fiction is a matter of window dressing. The question is the intent. And in my case, I've got a very pragmatic difference between science fiction and fantasy. If I'm writing fantasy, I get a nice big advance. If I'm writing science fiction, I get a small advance. <laughs> because I'm not known for science fiction, so I'd have to take a smaller advance. <laughs> but seriously, it, we I mean, we got bills to pay. What's, the, what's our muse, Misty? The mortgage. The mortgage is, is our, our muse. muse. We would be writing Chilton manuals for Hondas if it would pay the same. Hey, we're all like, indie or hybrid writers here we right on. trust me i i am a working class writer i am motivated by the paycheck yeah absolutely <laughs> i totally understand and we get this whole thing too because we have to do our all our own marketing right those of us who are doing independent publication right mm -hmm. which i hate <laughs> i absolutely mm -hmm. loathe it and so how do you brand yourself right like so that's, right, a big that's, that's a big Oh, I'm getting oh, I'm getting here. Sorry, I'm an echo. Sorry, I'm an echo. Sorry. Okay, I, okay. I hear that Sarah, I hear wants, that to Sarah speak. wants to speak. And you're next. And you're next. We do seem to be having some technical difficulties, folks. Yes. Sorry about that. I had a book publisher once say to me that the distinction between science fiction and fantasy was purely if you mention Earth, then it's science fiction, even if it's <laughs> set on another planet, with magical elements, because that way they knew where to put it on the bookshelf. That certainly does seem to be the way things were marketed in the 70s anyway. I've read a lot of 1970 science fiction recently. so. Uh, yeah, that seems to have been, I mean, okay, which world, right? Andre Norton, science fiction or fantasy? Yeah. It Always was, yes. When it, was, when it came out, it was shelved with the science fiction because they were all shelved together. Yeah, and I know this because I worked at a secondhand bookstore for a few years, and we would get all the classics in, all the classic science fiction and fantasy, and it said science fiction on the on the label, right? So, or Sarah's Can I interrupt for a second? Anyway. Sarah, I think we're getting background noise from you, which is why the camera is flicking back and forward. Gain may be up a little bit. Love the lipstick, <laughs> by the way. Thank you. I know she does the coolest lipstick, doesn't she? Yeah, now you're better? Like way loud, actually. Ooh. There is a bit of a machine hum there that I think is uh, activating a mic. It's you! It's you! You're humming. <laughs> She's an android. I knew it. That's not actually lipstick. That's a stock color. <laughs> oh, oh, my microphone changed. That's why. It's all right. We love you just the same. Okay, she's going to... There. Oh, okay. That's better. Thank it's you. Lovely. My ear was starting to hurt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Wait, like I it said, happens. Windows doesn't like me. So that ties into our subject. Uh, if this were a matter of magic, a spell would have fixed that. There you go. But it's not. It's I, science fiction, so we had to have a technical solution. That is right. Th that depends. That depends because in some magic worlds, magic and, and technology don't work well together, and I might have just caused it to blow up. Mm. There is we that. do that a lot. Yeah, I'm thinking about the automotive show earlier today, and we do that a lot. Yeah, you blow it up with magic. We make stuff blow up a lot. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> they say that uh, for those who believe in real life magic, as it were, that uh, real world witches tend to blow up electronic devices. If that <laughs> is so, I am guilty as charged. So, <laughs> well, I, I do might that. be a techno mage. There you go. There you go. Oh, I my, do my that. Dad was in the... hospital 
recently and he uh, yeah. they, they couldn't keep a heart monitor working. It just kept flatlining and they kept thinking he was dead. Oh, I do that with, uh, I, I've got a superhero series called The Secret World Chronicle that uh, I have one known techno shaman in the entire world and she actually works with computers and uh, interfaces tech and magic. Nice. Nice. Uh, that. That, was that was good. You know, Ironically, I kill watches and have since I was childhood. I would, I, I have to get a Timex watch. I can't wear any other kind hmm. because they'll die. And the mechanical watches go faster than any other kind. Hang so, on, you're, a, you're a rocket scientist. This is a bad thing. <laughs> well, I don't physically work on the rockets. Oh, I see. This is a good thing. Um, and most of my computers are shielded enough that they don't seem to be bothered. But it's not the first time I've heard about situations like this. There's a book called um, When Rabbit Howls, which is talking about someone who had um, something like nine personalities. Years. Yes, I um, remember that one. And the camera that they had on her was literally affected when she was there. And they kept getting um, crappy picture on the, on the videotapes they took. And they thought it was because of her electromagnetic field. It's so. fascinating. You know, a thing about uh, technology versus magic in various forms of fiction that just occurred to me to mention is that uh, the current word for magic in science fiction is nanites. Mm -hmm. Yes, nanites are the new magic. They can do anything. They really are, but it raises the point that uh, a thing about magic is that it tends to be a panacea. It's something that can accomplish pretty much everything that you want. It's hand wavery of the highest order. and uh, Well, it is in bad fiction. Well, it is, it is, but we've applied that in some of the magic in our books where if you use a healing spell, it will heal somebody. But if you are an anatomist, you will get a way better result because you can direct where the magic will heal. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, what happens is when you cast a regular healing spell, it's going to go through a list of I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this until something works. And so you get a lesser effect, but on a broader scale. If you have someone who is an anatomist, who is a surgeon, and then uses that to supplement their abilities, they'll get far greater results from far less amount of magic. And this is why uh, in the Mage Wars books, Black Griffin, White Griffin, Silver Griffin, um, Urtho was called the Mage of Silence. It's because uh, the use of magic was basically quite noisy as far as its signal goes. And you could always tell when troops with magic weapons were approaching because your sensors would pick up the noise that they're radiating magically, basically. Uh, much like if you have a flock of geese on radar, it's like, oh, look, there goes something moving. Bertho had developed a system of weights and measures, if you will. So he would use exactly the right amount of magic. And, and, there was nothing to, and there was nothing to produce noise. So as a result, he was thought of as being incredibly stealthy because of some unknown magic, when in fact, all he was doing was adding precision. He was eliminating magic feedback. Right exactly. On. Yeah. And, uh, and this was really interesting whenever it was put into the geopolitical situation of the time. He was a, a research scientist. He was not what you'd call a war mage by any means, uh, but he had what turned out to be an ultimate strategic advantage that caused him to become a leader without him really asking for it. People just flocked to him because, hey, he can do something nobody else can. He'll protect us all the time. He really just wanted to build stuff. That was always the sad thing about him. But it's a it's a I fun like thing. It's one of my favorite characters in your books, actually. Ortho, really? Uh, yeah, he was really. he's kind of an old horn dog, actually. Yeah. Yeah, but he's funny. He's cool. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, and then like you him. get and then you get Scandranan in there, who's uh, always tweaking his nose about, yeah, yeah, you made me, but I'm smarter than you. 
Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like what you're saying a lot is that often the application of scientific principles to the theories of magic make them better and more believable and more readable. Would you agree? I would go with the word relatable. That that's what a friend of mine at uh, when I worked still worked at American Airlines as a computer programmer. He was a hard science fiction reader, and then I. He said he he grudgingly said that he'd read my book because he know, knows me. And he came back and said, I like your books. It's magic with rivets. <laughs> magic with rivets. That's cool. That's now magic steampunk. Yeah, yeah, they call that steampunk. That's right. Right on. No, I like I like that very much. I think that uh, yeah, if it has a in a consistent system within the world that you've created, laws, you know, laws of metaphysics right to go with the laws of physics mm -hmm. you know and then you'll have archaeology in the place of technology mm -hmm. right which is another thing that i really like about the way you guys do things right like magic becomes part of the way people do their relationship with their world and they make use of it in their in their government and in their uh their logistics and you know, in, in the way they consider tactics and a lot of other aspects, right? Like it becomes part of the fabric. It's not just, it's not just something that's there, right? Like this is, this is my big criticism. A lot of role-playing worlds, right? You guys do tabletop role-playing games too. So you, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Where there's aspects where, okay, so there's these uber powerful Archmage people, right? And what do they do? you know right they're, you hear about them and they're they're always getting into adventures but are they fixing the sewer you know <laughs> right mm -hmm. you know it's interesting that you had mentioned that because uh we we get absolutely bored to tears on world building panels but the last one that we were on uh was with quite a lot of, of very very smart and, and interesting folk and they were all surprised when i said start with sewage Mm -hmm. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, you're going to have creatures. They're going to need sources of food. They're going to need shelter. They're going to need to get rid of their trash. They're going to need to get rid of the poop. Okay. Um, whenever you're looking at early cultures, uh, one of the things that is studied are what, what manner of sewage control did they have? Did they have open privies? Did they have pits? Did they have underground pipes? That sort of thing. Well, once you start looking at the very basics of infrastructure like that, you'll find that uh, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to have a city. You're going to think that city had to start with a small settlement, and then it expands outward from that. And then once you read a, reach a critical mass, the old pipes are not going to be big enough anymore. And so there will be a massive overhaul, which means there will be deeper digging, which will employ more people, which will require more food, which will need more fresh water. And you discover that as you think through these steps in the civil engineering, you wind up enriching the culture you were going to put there because you've thought through their history simply by starting with, where do they crap? See, I feel really good now because one of the books I've just finished my hero gets to blow up the sewerage system. Right, right. Yeah, awesome. and it, it's fantastic to that do can, something like that'll that. That'll cripple an, an entire city. Yeah, absolutely. It really will. Um, you know, the smallest of inconveniences can panic the largest number of people. And this goes back to a science fiction law, which I think was uh, a quote from Heinlein that I'll paraphrase. I think it was Bob Heinlein that said... Uh, the more complex the technology, the easier it is to disable with a hammer. That is a fact of life. I owned a new car once. Once? I never, once. I, I will, long story, husband was in a big car accident. It was uh, something that was provided through ICBC. That's our insurance, our provincial insurance money. Um, yeah, it, <laughs> new cars break really easy. They have like all these little gizmos in their slidey fancy doors mm -hmm. that cost 500 to $700 to replace every time they break. Yeah. And yeah, and they break if you lean on them too hard, right? So never again, I will never own another new car. It is too expensive. 
Well, as it happens yeah. right now on our, our auto show, um, we're working on a replica of a 66 Shelby Cobra, which is, Ed, oh, thank you. Uh, it's actually the hero car that I'm driving in a new series. I'm also an actor. And um, it's an extremely simple car. There are very few parts. But, of course, the fewer parts you have, the more every part affects every other part. And so I recommend studying automobiles as a great way to study magic systems. The reason is an automobile, this thing that we sit in that maybe we may think of as an appliance, is a majestic alchemical creature. It takes in the wind, the air that's around us, and it mixes it with gasoline which is drawn from the earth that combines it into a vapor that then lightning strikes to cause it to explode inside a block that is made of iron drawn from deep within the earth's crust that was formed in a star at one point and whenever you look at a car that way you realize it's it's a fantastically magical system that you sit in and operate that's awesome. Yeah. I hate to say this, but I have got to take a break. That's right. It's time for a bio for Misty, so I will fill in. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Itty, We're not bitty kidneys. Oh, I hear you. Yeah, it's, it's cool. amazing because we tricked sand into thinking. <laughs> you going okay. to the studio? Yes. Okay. That's the closest. Okay. It's quite dark out there right now, Misty. So. There you go. Um, we have a flashlight for you. We try to think of everything. Salute. All right, I'll come and frame in here. Hi, folks. Hi. Hey. Uh, I tend to look at uh, at things like uh, you know electrical systems, grids, uh, these these interconnected things uh, that we have in our daily lives in the real world, even things like what we're doing right now. Uh, communicating by webcam, we have this this wonderful writer all the way on the other side of the planet from the rest of us. You know, she's in Australia. That is magic. Yeah, you're and right. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, whenever you think about how it applies to us in a fantasy point of view, uh, we have a device in the Valdemar books called a Teleson, and it is effectively a webcam as far as its That's function cool. goes. Yeah. Um, but it's created magically. We go into how it's described. Uh, what I think is important for us when we think about fantasy is how does it relate to the reader in their real lives? You know, no one's going to really apply anything about how your spell system works. But what they'll apply is how your character thinks about the spell system. Uh, one thing that we do in our books that's a constant is coping. That's uh, one of the things that affects the readers the most with what we do, is that when our characters face adversity, we don't just say, oh, and then the monster was defeated. We stay within their heads as they figure out how to deal with the adversity that's in front of them. Whenever you're a 13, 14 year old kid, who's looking at a world that is bewilderingly dangerous at every turn, which is our world, it's really nice to see an example of somebody thinking things through and getting it right. And I think that's what really behooves us as writers to do as a, a simple, considerate service to our readers is give them something that they can use, not just something they can entertain them. I think that's something that uh, you guys do really well. It's something that Sarah does really well. I happen to know from reading her books. Uh, coping is a big part of the plot of her uh, Rune Spell series, which is an urban fantasy, right? And uh, it's something that I know I've tried to consider. Uh, Sarah, I think, wanted to say something, so. Oh, well, um, just to launch off of that, um, you know, I, I really do think that it is important to have characters who you, you follow through with the psychological and emotional fallout of what they encounter. 
And that is actually one of the things that I've gotten a lot of feedback positively about is that I do walk them through it. It's not just that a hero, you know, defeats the bad guy, et cetera, et cetera. It's that they then have to deal with that in a very, very real way. I have, you know, I gave my character PTSD for the third book, and she's probably going to have that for a couple of books yet because, you know, you can't face the kinds of things that a person has to face in these situations and walk away like it isn't a thing. You know, you just, you cannot do that. You can't take somebody who, you know, being in an urban fantasy, um, the, it's the real world, quote unquote, with a fantasy undertone. And so, you know, she is literally just like the rest of us, except all of a sudden now she's dealing with demons and gods and, and things like that. You can't throw that at somebody and have them just be like, oh, OK, sure. You know, there's going to mm -hmm. be some effects on that. You know, if you face down a god you cannot walk away and just be like an atheist or, you know, something, yeah. you know, at some point your brain's going to be like, but wait, okay, we I'm know they get, exist now. I'm going to get snarky. This is fun. <laughs> awesome. um, I was in, I did some uh, uh, comics, a lot of indie comics, but I also did some stuff for Marvel and all that. And I used to give Chris Claremont a hard time about this. Um, he was writing the X-Men uh, through the 80s and 90s and all of that and it did wonderful, wonderful work. Uh, but his great blind spot that I teased him on was I invented the term Claremontinuity. And Claremontinuity is uh, the situation in a comic series in which characters undergo uh, world persecution, incredible injuries, uh, cosmic forms of pain and life and death with no visible effects, the following issue. Well, yeah, that's a superhero <laughs> genre thing, isn't it, right? And yet now uh, comics is, is one of the most magnificent forms of adventure writing you can find now. It's just wonderful. And uh, you get characters that are being written who have long lasting effects, psychological effects, PTSD. Uh, and these are things that I think should be addressed. Um, one of the things about a hero, if you will, uh, that has changed since the fiction of the 1940s and 50s is it used to be enough that the hero won. Nowadays, that's not enough for a readership. What matters is that your hero found what was within themselves to cause them to bother. And then the cost of it. And then the repercussions of it and how you carry that on. Because we do live in a world with repercussions. And mm -hmm. folks need to know how to handle that. I mean, uh, uh, I don't want to get too personal on it. Uh, you know, on a world broadcast, right? Uh, but... I was a firefighter, you know, rescue worker. I've been a manhunter. I was a race car driver. I've had a lot of injuries. Um, we have had uh, five stalkers. Uh, two of them were murderers. Uh, we used to operate a safe house for uh, runaways and uh, battered spouses. And so we've had our, our run-ins with some very difficult times in life. And as we dealt with these things, we incorporate them into the work, but we keep one particular thing in mind that I think is important for anybody who writes fantasy to remember. Sometimes in an emergency, in a moment of duress, confusion, all somebody can remember is something they read in a book. So we make sure that whenever we write people that are dealing with bad situations, we consult good psychologists. We talk with people about things that similar stuff has happened to, and we show how you cope with it. Uh, whenever we're writing a section that involves survival in wilderness or something, we consult actual survival experts to teach real techniques because heaven forbid somebody goes down in a plane and they're stuck somewhere for a couple of days. They may only remember something they read in a fantasy book. Yeah, fair enough. You're absolutely right. And it's something that, yeah, probably we should be considering. 
Sarah, you wanted to say something to that, and then I think I'm going to change the topic here. Okay. Um, One of my favorite quotes is, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I'm not going to remember it exactly, but um, it's essentially that we don't read fairy tales because we need to believe in dragons. We We read fairy tales because we need to believe that we can defeat the dragons. And in a lot of ways, modern fantasy and sci-fi have really broached that where, you know, the psychological fallout is the dragon. We don't just need to defeat the monster. We need to know that we can survive what comes after that. And I think that's why you have so much, you know, the the anti-hero, the gritty hero, the broken hero, you know, concept going on today is because it's what we need to see is people surviving that fallout. I concur. I think of it as a professional responsibility, to be honest. Yeah, it's it's all about the flawed hero these days. It's not about the perfect Superman. It's about how real you can make them so people will relate to them. Well, and I think reality doesn't make you... Uh, the flaws aren't just the reality. I think that's that's how you make real people. People who don't have any flaws don't come across as real. They don't Often I try to center my story in the flaw, right? The the impetus, the thing that sends you, the call to adventure, as it were, if we're going to use Campbellian terms, right, mm-hmm. is whatever the flaw is, you know, they don't fit into where you're from. You have post-traumatic stress and you need to get over your internal demons, whatever it is, right? That's the impetus. Uh, Edith Piaf said that you should use your flaws, you know, use what you do wrong, use what you overreach at, use what you fall apart on, because that is what truly makes you unique. One of the things that you're looking at as a creative professional, if you're if you're in SIFWA and you're doing fantasy, is you want to bring the book that only you can write. You don't want to be interchangeable and generic. You'll simply get lost in actually a few serious ways. What we do is discovery. I agree with you. Um, All right, we're done here then. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is pretty close to that time, actually. It is 11.30, <laughs> just so that people are aware. Um, uh, we're scheduled for an hour, but you know, if people want to carry on for a few minutes, I had a couple more questions I wanted to pose to the panel. And if you're willing to do that, and if not, you know, tell me you're busy and it's cool. You know, bring your, either way. Bring your thunder. Bring, bring my thunder. Okay. How little magic is required to make it fantasy? There's a question. Example, classic novel, Orlando, Virginia Wolf, right? Like, the only thing in it that is at all fantastical is all of a sudden, halfway through the novel, the character who is male wakes up and is female. And it's all about the results of that gender switch and how that affects how people treat the character, how it affects how the character views him or herself, right? Um, Is that fantasy? Let's go back to David Farland's definition. Everything's fantasy. I, I would actually say it was because that's the that's the key element in there. And without that switch, you don't have the story. I will put this forth. Here's something to consider. The amount of magic that is needed for it to be fantasy is zero. All you need is for characters to have the belief that there is magic to affect their actions. That's that's cool. So you would put stuff like um, uh, the Gears. I don't remember their first name, but they write that series, People of the River, People of the Sea, right? Historical fiction, right? Um, dealing with First Nations peoples, right? In uh, North America at, you know, their various times of their height or end of their cultures and civilizations the characters often believe very strongly in the spirituality that is associated with their particular first nation and culture and that to them it's very real and it's described from the character's point of view as if they had this encounter with the spirit of raven or Mm -hmm. 
this so that's fantasy then well it's uh i'd like to go into something that historians and anthropologists point out which is what is myth to us was once pretty much a fact of life to someone in the past uh the whole reason that we have religion as i was discussing with somebody earlier is because of the same reason we have science we want to figure out what the heck is going on uh, most of what we think of as magic systems are derived from people trying to figure out what the hell is happening around me and how can we affect it. One of the basic motivations that we carry through in virtually all the characters that we write is the desire to be effective. And that's something that really resonates with audiences these days. Uh, a thing about having the internet and all of this international communication is that we've also become aware, unfortunately, of how ineffective we can be. So anything that will support the idea that we can affect the world really feels good. Uh, so whenever you're looking at a, a culture that incorporates magic into their culture, they never have to see so much as a sleight of hand trick. They just have to believe that it's out there affecting them for it to have the effect of a spell. And as humans, we are actually genetically predisposed to have faith and belief in something. So hence, modern people, even if they're atheists, they'll, they'll switch to believing in the universe or to believing in science, and they effectively take the place of whatever magic system they used to believe in. The discussion I had earlier tonight with a young man who is very devoutly Christian and an adorable man, uh, he asked me about my spirituality, and I said... I could go into a great deal of detail about that, but after studying so many of the world's religions for so long, I've decided that my spirituality amounts to be good to other people and try not to suck. <laughs> I'm down with that. And you can build an entire life philosophy around that. Be excellent to each other and party on dudes. <laughs> there are a lot of variations that boil down to the same thing. There are. It's amazing how often that message is repeated. It's really true. I think playing off on what he was just saying, though, is something that I find is very compelling when I'm reading a book and something I try very hard to do when I'm writing a book, and that is to have very proactive characters, characters that are not just um, subject to things happening to them and they react to whatever is happening, but they don't actually try and do anything themselves. And so I have a tendency to have characters that really um, are driven to make changes without necessarily being prompted. I like that too. I, I, yeah, that's a pet peeve of mine, a character that's entirely reactionary. I expect the character to act at some point. I think my worst time encountering that was when a friend gave me his novel and he spent 600 pages writing it. And I had to honestly tell him that he had not written a novel. He'd written a travelogue. It was described so very, very well, but every character was so passive that I could not to this day tell you one of their names. But I remember his descriptions of the places. <laughs> No, people tend to be, by their nature, and I say this having worked a lot of emergencies, human beings tend to be reactive by nature. So the idea of a character that is proactive is inherently attractive to us. The fact that anybody will take an action tends to make us think of them as leaders, whether it's the right action or not. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's fair. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask one last question. Right, and uh, we got into this a bit in the what is science fiction panel as well, right? Is there a difference between genre fiction and literary fiction? Is there a difference between, is there a point at which fantasy becomes literary fiction? And is there a difference and does it matter? We have found one practical difference. Literature people get paid a stipend or an appearance fee. No, there's another practical difference. <laughs> <laughs> People who write literary fiction never make a living at it. People who write genre fiction at least have a chance of making a living at it. Neil Gaiman, 
uh, described how pretty much every time he does a talk at a university, the first thing that anybody asks him is what university he teaches at because they can't believe he re makes a living at writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people who write literary fiction are usually appalled to be called genre writers, whereas genre fiction writers are like, oh, you think I'm literary? Huh, there you yeah. go. Uh, and, these and, days, and, and literary fiction writers collect awards. Yes, yes. Genre fiction writers collect royalties. You know, Misty and I, <laughs> we, we don't get awards. I mean, that's the thing. We've never been nominated for a Hugo oh, we, or a we Nab. Or no, well, not, not a Hugo or anything, best, but we've, we've gotten a couple awards. Yeah, the best one we got, uh, which I'm happy to say the day after Transgender Awareness Day. <laughs> hooray, everybody in the world. Yeah, hooray, that's um, right. That's right. Uh, is we got a Lambda Award, which is a wonderful thing. As an LGBTQ person myself, obviously, uh, you know, I think that's awesome, right? I know that for me, when I first encountered the last Herald Mage of Valdemar, right, I was just like, "Oh God!" What? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you have heard you the seen... story before, have you? I'm have sure you, you have, right? <laughs> have you seen the Ursula cartoon? Yeah, Ursula. Uh, Ursula Vernon did this beautiful cartoon. She's a she. She uh, she did get a Hugo, oddly enough, uh, for her comic Digger. Uh, very good. Uh, but uh, the 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 uh, the cartoon is basically, um, I guess, it's a little girl yeah. sitting cross-legged on the on the floor reading the last herald mage and the balloon over her over her head is going you mean that's an option and yeah. the caption is the first time i learned about uh uh gay characters was reading mercedes lackey's valdemar books yep see i was just delighted i was like what he's the hero he's not the comic relief this is great you yeah. know it gave representation is important Right. So anybody who doubts that, who says that, you know, it's not, uh, you know, do we really need to see this? Do we really need love Simon right now? Yeah, we do. Sure. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Well, I was joking with my tech over here that uh, uh, nobody write letters. This is intended with love, absolute love. That because it was uh, Transgender Awareness Day, we spent the episode changing the gender fluid in the car. <laughs> <laughs> So I killed the host. So <laughs> oh dear. She's Our gender broken. fluid was running low. Yep, she's out. That's it. Okay. Okay. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, um, Sarah, you might say if you got something to say. I've got a, I've got a trans friend and I'm gonna have to ask I'm gonna have to ask uh, her that uh, um, if she got her if she got her gender today. fluid changed today. That's, right. <laughs> That's great. Very cool. Yeah. Um. Yeah, um. My personal opinion about this, right? I'm reminded of. Uh, I saw this great archive talk between uh, where they featured Margaret Atwood and Ursula Le Guin. Mm -hmm. Right. And they were they're kind of the at, uh, the opposite poles of this particular oh, yeah. discussion. Right. Um, I'm on Ursula's side. <laughs> yeah. Right. She was very much about, you know what? Good fiction is good fiction. You want to call it a genre? Go ahead. But I'm, you know, liter science fiction and fantasy can be literary, too, because good fiction is good fiction. And, is. and Margaret Atwood was like. You know, no, 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 what, no yeah. it can't be, it can't be. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, see, yeah. I, 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 I've seen her have hysterics over being called genre fiction before. But I mean, come on, I read the Mad Adam trilogy, <laughs> you know? Okay, you know, you, you can make an argument, I think, that um, The Handmaid's Tale is kind of on the border you know, okay, I would call science fiction because dystopia for me has always been a subgenre of science fiction, right? Mm -hmm. But okay, you can make an argument, right? There's no, you can't make an argument for the Mad Adam trilogy. This is absolute, total, unbridled science fiction gone mad. We've all seen the movies. You know, she wrote it very well. 
it's an it's an awesome series. I really enjoy it. But as far as I'm concerned, it is clearly science fiction, right? Or fantasy, right? You can say that too, because some of it is, you know, is this really possible with science, right? So again, there's there's the border, right? So for me, yeah, I I think that uh, I don't know, right? Like I th I think that a lot of publishing companies are looking for any excuse to get you out of the science fiction and fantasy section. I see a lot of things that if they were popular, they end up in the, or if they were literary, if somebody gave them a literary award, right, they end up in the front of the store, right? And if they don't get those things and they have a fantastical element, they end up at the back of the store in that little section that's half Star Wars books, right? So, um, and I find that frustrating personally. I, I really kind of don't like that at all because it uh, it demeans the work of a lot of people and why are we still having this argument now we've had science fiction and fantasy for forever where everybody goes and watches the marvel movies you know like are, aren't we over this it's well, okay the nerds are taking over the earth we'll get there uh, I, I've always had the opinion that literary fiction has a certain elitism backing it up and, you know, there's a point to that and, you know, yay, whether people like it or not. But to me, the big difference between literary fiction and genre fiction is the amount of, shall we call it, purple prose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, I do not write literary fiction, not because I can't, not because I don't like it. Well, actually, it is because I don't like it. <laughs> If I'm going to read something for entertainment and not for scientific value, then I don't want my brain to have to work 300 times more than it actually has to to get to the point. Yeah. And to be, yeah. To be completely candid, I can write literary any day of the week and it bores the hell out of me. I would rather be writing adventure. Well, and, you know, we, we were talking about uh, dyslexia before we started uh, my husband is dyslexic many of us here have either dyslexia or people who have dyslexia adding that extra layer of unnecessary flowery <laughs> language is, well it's it's just it's it's a way of separating us into kind of readership classes like you don't get to read this because for some reason you know you don't have the vocabulary you don't have the education you don't have you know this that or the other thing to decipher the 25 dollars words i don't like it i i think that it's it's divisive and divisive. i write to entertain so yes i, I, I want to jump in with a story because it's it's a really good fit for this conversation when i was i took one English class in college because I tested out of my other English classes and I didn't have to take much as an engineering physics teacher, a student, um, but it was a creative writing class that I took. And the teacher was one of those people who writes the kind of poetry that if you took it at face value, it, it means nothing. It just gives you a headache. You know, what is the point of this? So he told me almost from the very beginning of the class, he goes, I don't know why you're in here. He goes, you've already, you write stuff anybody could read. And he meant it as an insult. But that's not how I think. No, no, not at all. And I don't I don't want to be uh, divisive on the subject of the show itself, but the question of what is fantasy, ultimately, who cares? Did you like it? Was it good? Does right. it matter what you classify it as? It's important, it's important to understand that at the core of it, in all of human history, the point of politics is to divide people into groups. And you use the term earlier, it can be argued that, and my first thought is, some people think that arguing is the point, but it's really not. Uh, people got bent over the idea that Sifwa became science fiction and fantasy writers of America, and if you were around, I mean, I thought people were going to open veins over this because they just had to get so bent about it. And ultimately, who cares? Are you writing well? Are you making people happy? You teaching? You paying a bill? 
I agree with you. Um, well, in I, that case, you're my enemy because I'm divisive. <laughs> I'd like to discuss things and compare ideas. I'm not interested in letting blood out of my veins over it. You know, let's, uh, you know, let, we can agree to disagree at a certain point if it gets that heated. But, okay, I like literary fiction. Mm -hmm. I actually enjoy it. I find it really interesting. And my husband does not. He is a longtime science fiction reader and he is he hates it right and i get it right to me it's its own in a way it's its own genre right i don't think i think that a lot of the people who work in the literary community like sarah said there tends to be this classist element right they have this idea that this is what superior fiction looks like no this is what a particular genre of fiction looks like when it is done well and it doesn't have to be that way to be good fiction you know that's my opinion i like to put a little everything in my books you know humor and romance and good characters and adventure and science and fan I like everything in there and I'm really not a big fan of trying to pigeonhole things with a label uh unfortunately it, it, booksellers are I yeah. know yeah that's a that's a truism among marketing especially <laughs> uh, it's important to remember if you see your book marketed poorly that they don't have any idea what's going on they're doing their best everybody's trying their best um there's more hope now for everybody that wants to write something unusual because we now have all these great new distribution methods thanks to the net. And if you've ever studied the the long tail theory in economics, uh, it's possible for you to write exactly what you want to write and still make a living at it because you have the long tail of very dedicated fans who will buy anything you create. For some musicians, they only need a thousand people that will buy everything they release for them to make a living. And it's nice because it allows you, if you're able to market yourself well enough on the net, to really write what you personally dig. One thing that's true, uh, this is an Oki saying, I have a lot of them. One of them is uh, people eat what they're fed. And what that means basically is a lot of people don't really absorb something until it's presented to them. A lot of people don't know what they want till they see it. So that's a great reason to keep writing what you really want to write. That's what I do. Yeah. Okay. I, th I think we'd better think about uh, starting to wrap this up. Um, we've already gone fairly late. Um, this, uh, what do you guys got coming up? Let's, uh, briefly discuss what we have on the plate that is coming up in the near future for everybody. What, what are your current projects? What's your next book coming out? What's going on? Well, I've just, I've got a series, um, this is for you, Misty. Hey! ADAD, because we were talking about computer games before. This one's a down the rabbit hole computer game book. There's five of them. They've had you know, reasonably good success already and it's on your freebie list. So give that one a go and if you like it, tell me. Um, and I've just released this one, Shadows Wake, which is the first in an urban fantasy trilogy. A lot of fun to write because I do martial arts and so, you know, so does my heroine. Hence the sword in my hair. <laughs> I love that. And uh, after that, I've got another trilogy, which is my science uh, fantasy trilogy coming out as well. So I'm having a busy year. Stephanie, what about you? What are you doing this year? Um, I just released Ideal Insurgent, which is as close to hard science fiction as I do. But I'm always a character person, first and foremost and always. Um, so the characterizations are really big on this. Uh, I have a book that's coming out and, and most of the, I know Diane and you do too, are coming out in the, the On the Horizon book bundle, which is coming out on May 1st. And that's a fan, that's pure fantasy. Um, I even bring in pantheons and all kinds of fun stuff, you know, throw everything in there. 
And then um, I'm doing sequels to two of, I've got one for my science fantasy series, which is the Bet novels, the Shapeshifters. I've got a third book coming called Twice the Man. And um, then I'm going to do a follow up for my sword and sorcery story, uh, Curse of the Genre. I'm doing Children of the Genre. Uh, that's also going to get written this year. And then I've got another fantasy story that's based on a video game I've never played my ex-husband used to love called mist hmm. and so i'm going to be going down that path and the that's going to be the library at castle period so my plate is full plus i've got some anthologies but that's i admire you people i think you're insane i it's amazing what you can do and misty too right misty puts oh. out what did they say 5.5 novels a year oh god well all right so i might as well start um i'm currently working on five books at once uh i'm working on the sequel to silence with cody martin I'm working on the next Griffin book with Larry. I'm working on another book for Disney Hyperion, which is unfortunately not in the in the Hunter sequence. It's actually pure fantasy, uh, which is called Godmother's Apprentice at the moment. They'll probably change the name. <laughs> uh, I'm working on the next Elemental Masters series uh, book, which is called. Uh, I call it the adventures of the bartered brides, but they just want to call it bartered brides without the adventures of, of on it because it's one of the ones that has Sherlock Holmes in it and Conan Doyle always had the adventure of the something or other in it. So I kind of wanted to be true to that, but Daw wants the shorter title. So we'll give Daw what they want. Um, and I'm working on the last Elvin Bain novel and we're working actually i'm working on six books at once uh, i'm working on a book with eluki uh rosemary edgehill which is called the ferns they drop their tears which is another one of the bedlam bedlam bards books and coming out in june is the next valdemar book which is the Family Spies Trilogy, the beginning of the of the Family Spies Trilogy. It's called The, the Hills Have Spies, which Larry hates the title. And I, <laughs> no, I don't else, hate it. Everybody else loves the title. I don't hate it at all. I think it's awesome. I love The Hills Have Eyes, both versions. And so I find The Hills Have Spies to be hilarious. Um, I just expect, you know, cannibalistic rednecks to be in it but. It's, it's entirely possible uh that um the uh the sequel to silence will be coming out this year it's going to depend upon getting cody to get his butt in gear and wait the sequel to silence is titled wait did you hear something no it's called breaking <laughs> silence <laughs> and i'll probably do the cover for it and he'll probably do the cover for it yeah and the uh the next the last of the secret world chronicle books which if you took all the the action in the the previous four and crammed it into one book you'd have you'd have that one it's called uh, secret world chronicle avalanche mm -hmm. because uh i'm taking that old babylon 5 saying the avalanche has begun it is too late for the pebbles to vote um <laughs> which i also did the cover for which he also did yeah. the cover for. That uh, whole series is odd because um, I wind up getting a lot of, of jobs doing covers for Misty's books because our editors know that I, I started in the field as a book cover artist uh, before I started doing novels and other stuff. Uh, and they figure, well, you're already in the same house. You're going to know the material. So I, <laughs> So they wind up throwing works. gigs. Yeah, they wind up throwing gigs at me for doing Misty's books, and I'm like, "There's not the slightest nepotism involved. They just figure they don't have to explain as much to me, so I get the gig." Well, you might as well take off with what you're doing. Well, I became an executive producer for Zombie Orpheus Entertainment. Uh, we're the folks that do Journey Quest, and uh, and the gamers, and the gamers, 
And if you've ever seen the gamers and, films and uh, uh, Demon Hunters, Demon Hunters, uh, let's see, Natural One, uh, Dark Dungeons, which is is hilarious. They actually got the rights to the infamous Dark Dungeons chick tract, and they did it straight. And they played it straight, and it is so it freaking is so funny. unintentionally <gasps> funny. Oh, anyway, uh, we were able to. If you've ever seen the gamers films, we were able to reunite the original cast. And pick up their characters 15 years later. And uh, we're in development for uh, a new supernatural espionage series called Nine Tales. And that's the one that we're building the, the Shelby Cobra for. That's the hero car for it. And what's lovely about that is that it's about a network of actors and fantasy and science fiction writers and game designers who are agents for a supernatural espionage agency and being fantasy and sci-fi writers is their cover. Which means... Pick me! Pick me! Pick me. Which, means, <laughs> which means we're getting cameos shot uh, from all of these different celebrities. Uh, actually, the last one we shot, oddly enough, was Eric Estrada, but um, uh, we have so many different... Uh, big name writers in the field that do their call-ins to me as director Griffin uh, with their code name on the screen and everything. And all of these are only like 20 seconds long, but they're peppered all through the episode as part of the storyline. Uh, so it's turning into, if you remember uh, 1966 Batman or the TV show Laugh-In, where the thing to do was to have a cameo on one of those shows, even if it was for just a moment. It's turning into that. Uh, we're talking like um, Ed Greenwood. His his code name is Archmage, and Bob Salvatore is Dark Elf, and it's all these you know one Robin after Hobb. another. Uh, Robin Hobb, who picked the code name Troglodyte. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm doing a lot of film work lately. Um, got more book covers coming up, of course, and uh, working on Hot Rods. Um, but one of the big things that is in development that'll be out towards the end of the year is the Kickstarter for The Art of Larry Dixon. Cool. And I've been doing nice. it. I've had 35 years in the business, and I was invited in by Anne McCaffrey and Michael Whalen. And I've never had an Art of book until now, so it's about time. Nice. I'm looking forward to that. That's very cool. Yeah, count me in. Thanks. That's great. I appreciate it. I need all the help I can get. Sarah. Sarah, you're up. Yes. Um, okay, so I have a series of short stories coming out in anthologies. Uh, Precious Scars is an anthology for mental illness uh, called A Whisper of Hope. And um, then I'm doing a time travel anthology. The story will be called A Time and a Place. So that'll be coming out. I don't know what the title of the anthology is yet. Um, the Chains That Bind is book three of the Rune Spells series. Books one and two, Too Weird and Fluffy Bunny, are already out and available on Amazon. The Chains That Bind, I am waiting on the publisher for that. And then I will be working on book four which is the blood of the moon and in between that i have um a kind of a mage punk type of uh, series that i'm going to be starting called the magus series or the magus chronicles I haven't quite decided on which one uh starting with thread reader and a time and a place is actually going to be kind of a prequel story to that so that's all i've planned out yet <laughs> I'm looking forward to the next book in the Rune Spell series. I'm I'm a fan, right? I really like her her Rune Spells work. I think it's excellent. It's uh, Norse mythology meets urban fantasy. It's you know it's worth looking at. I think, but yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I'll just say a couple brief things about what we got coming up in the shows in the near future, and uh, that won't take long. On April twenty first, we're doing. Spec Women Chat. Our topic for that is going to be speculative uh, romance. So romance that has a speculative element. 
I've asked Sarah back for that one because she also writes under the pen name Lena Gracie. And uh, Catherine Asaro is our headliner, as it were, for that panel. And we're still finalizing the last people. And then uh, I, I don't really have a clear date yet for the next episode of the panel. But I believe the topic is going to be steampunk. So. Well, Dynamite, I'd, uh, I'd like to say that I've had a wonderful time visiting with all of you. Thank you so very much for having us. And thank, thank you for thank you thank you for putting up with our technical difficulties. Just thank you so much for you know making your personal time available, and you know it's really been an honor to meet you guys. Um, thank you very much, Larry, for reaching out to me on Twitter. This is how we ended up having this conversation. I think he saw a discouraged. Uh, I don't know, emerging writer, I guess they call it, right? And he was trying to be encouraging to me, and then we had, you know, started this conversation. So I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. And I'd like to thank everybody else for showing up at all. You know, thank you, Ike. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Stephanie, for showing up at your various odd hours and working hard to coordinate this with all the other things that were going on. And I've had a great time. And anytime you guys, you know, if you want to stay in touch, I'm happy to do that. I'd love to talk to any one of you again. Sounds great. I'm really glad to have been on here and I appreciate the, uh, the chance to chat with everybody. I had fun. Thanks. It was great. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us on the panel and we will see you next time. Good night. Good night.